Margaret Martinosi. I am a professor here at Princeton in computer science. And I'm also happily the director of the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education, which is the home of eLab and the host of these demo days. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really pleased to see all of you here joining us for these pitches and demos. They culminate months and months of hard work by the eLab teams. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background, if I might. So the Keller Center was founded 13 years ago with the goal of crystallizing novel educational experiences for Princeton students, as well as the goal of knitting together many different disciplines on campus. Uh, we all work in support of the innovation, entrepreneurship, and societal impact that we know the different disciplines on campus can bring to important problems. And at its very core, Keller is about giving students and faculty a platform from which to go ahead and attack those problems. Um, I've actually been a Princeton engineering professor for 24 years now, and that puts me in an excellent position to see sort of the before and the after. So I can actually remember when Ed Zhao came to the engineering school at Princeton and said, we should teach entrepreneurship here. Um, we should let students see those kinds of pathways as well. And at the time, it seemed kind of unusual, um, but now it seems like the most natural thing in the world um, for students to get to see those kinds of pathways in addition to the pathways that they see intellectually through their major. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, and, and I should say that Keller, when it was formed, it, it took into its uh, portfolio that original entrepreneurship class, other classes, it's created a certificate program, which is Princeton's version of a minor in entrepreneurship. And over all of that, we have really moved the needle in terms of student and overall community experiences around entrepreneurship, innovation, and design. Um, so how? Uh, so first of all, we create and we support innovative classes on campus. Yes, entrepreneurship, but also design thinking, uh, the interface of technology and society, and engineering pedagogy itself. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is we operate at the scale of a department, even though we are much smaller than a department. So we teach a total enrollment and headcount over 1,000 students a year from our um, humble abode uh, as the Keller Center. We also offer co-curricular activities. You're seeing one of them here today, eLab. There's also Tiger Challenge. And through those, students can form multidisciplinary teams and go immerse themselves in projects outside the classroom. A lot of those activities get run through Princeton's Entrepreneurial Hub uh, at 34 Chambers Street. And if you haven't been there, you really must stop by. It's over by the uh, Nassau Inn in downtown Princeton. Uh, where the rest of Princeton can get a little sleepy in July and August, um, these folks can tell you that the Hub has been a real beehive of activity over the summer, hosting these programs, and also hosting some very nascent startups as well. Um, Keller, I view it as a place where we incubate themes and then let them go across campus. Entrepreneurship is one of them. Design thinking is another one that's in the incubator right now and starting to go broad across campus as well. Um, so today we're about to hear about and celebrate the accomplishments of the summer's eLab Accelerator teams. eLab has both an academic year component and also a summer component. Uh, the application process actually started for these folks uh, in mid-December. Uh, then there were interviews in January, February, and from those, these teams were selected to participate in this hub. One of the things that's important to me is that the program gives them space to work. It also gives them a stipend, so they don't have to choose about you know, sort of financial aid criteria, blah, blah, blah. They get enough money to live on, and they also get a place to work, a place to live. But most importantly, eLab gives these students access to advice and to mentorship, both from the Keller Center faculty and from a huge network of really helpful other Princeton faculty, team advisors, and alums. So if you are one of these mentors, faculty, team advisors, uh, who have been helping these eLab teams, can I please ask you to stand? Do we have some advisors in the room? I would love to give those folks a round of applause. Ah. I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels great gratitude for the support network that you've given these students. I would also like to thank uh, the incomparable Stephanie Landers, who steers this ship. She runs eLab. She keeps things on track. She knows, uh, she 
makes the teams as effective and successful and impressive as they are through her hard work. So thank you, Stephanie, as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cornelia Hillstrunk, who is the executive director of Keller and who can tell you a little bit more about today's events. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 eLab Demo Day. This is a very exciting, exciting day for all of us. So what exactly is the eLab? Well, first and foremost, it's an educational experience for our students. It's a 10-week summer accelerator program for student startups. As part of the eLab program, we offer the students up to $25,000 in seed funding. They have access to a workspace in the new entrepreneurial hub that Margaret described. It's a 15,000 square foot facility. It's a wonderful buzzing place. They also get housing. But most importantly, they get advice from a set of hand-picked mentors. We pick about five mentors per team. In addition, a faculty advisor is dedicated to each individual team and meets with the team once a week. On top of that, the student teams have the ability to participate in various entrepreneurial trainings and networking opportunities during the summer. And of course, everything culminates in demo days. This one here today in Princeton, and then there's another one tomorrow in New York City as well. When we ask what does eLab really mean to our students, we get some wonderful testimonials. eLab, for many of our students, truly is transformative. It is about finding novel pathways and about considering entrepreneurship a realistic option after graduation. Today's cohort is following in some really big footsteps. Six cohorts have come before this current one. The program, the ELAP program, was started in 2012. Since then, we've had over 200 students participate in the program and over 40 teams. We've had two-thirds of those have been commercial ventures and about a third have been social ventures. And I'm very proud to say that about half of the teams are founded by women or underrepresented minorities. They work on all sorts of industries, and you can see a spread up there. Everything from IT and mobile, to health, to education, to food, and so, so much more. And today's class cohort is no different. They have really worked hard this summer, and they are exceptionally excited to share their progress with you today. Now on to some housekeeping. Each team has a two-minute video that they've prepared for today, so they'll start with that. Then they'll go into an eight-minute pitch. And then we'll ask our feedback panel to ask them some questions. At this juncture, we're limiting it to questions from the feedback panel. And I'm really delighted to introduce them to you. With us today is Kef Kasdan, class of 85. She's the president and executive director of the Princeton Alumni Corps. Phil Kennard is the co-founder and CEO of Future Stay. Eric Lund, class of 92, the CTO emeritus of Signal. And Susan Solinsky. Class of 96, co-founder of Vital Score. Big round of applause for you. Thank you. <laughs> After the formal pitches are over, that's not the end of the event. The meat of the event is actually the networking and the demo stations upstairs. So please make sure to interact with the teams up there. They're really looking forward to getting to know all of you much better. So before I leave the podium, I would be remiss if I didn't express a few gratitudes and thank yous as well. I'd like to thank uh, first uh, Professor Ed Chow, who is the lead faculty advisor for the eLab program and who hosts the week-long eLab boot camp at the beginning of every summer. He has guided the teams throughout the summer. I also want to call out the faculty advisors, Professor Hijazi, Professor Johnson, and Professor Marcus, who have guided the teams. We really could not do it without the external mentors and advisors. Many of you are here in the room, and I also want to second my thanks to all of you for doing what you do. Thank you so much. And finally, but certainly not lastly, a huge thanks to the eLab team, which is headed by Stephanie Landers 
and supported by Madison Epke, as well as the four fantastic student associates who you'll get to meet in just a moment. So with that, Stephanie. Thanks, Cornelia. And thank you, everyone, for coming out to our seventh annual demo day. I'm Stephanie Landers. I'm the program manager of the Keller Center. And um, it's really been another uh, wonderful, exciting summer with all of you. Um, it's really hard to believe that it's almost over. Um, so for the audience, you're about to hear from some incredibly bright, talented, and hardworking, super motivated, um, staying up all night, uh, you know, not eating for days kinds of <laughs> students here. Um, and it's been a real pleasure working with all of them this summer. Um, but before we get to their presentations, um, I just wanted to call special attention to our Fab Four associates that Cornelia had alluded to. Um, so uh, we have uh, four um, wonderful undergrads, Bio Okasanya, Savannah McIntosh, Tim Feng, and Crystal Cohen. These four have worked tirelessly the entire summer. They have um, kept the hub in order, they've set up events, they've planned fun outings for the teams, challenges and puzzles, and they've sent out frequent emails and program updates, and they've really worked closely with the teams um, over the last nine and a half weeks, and they've really helped a lot. Um, I think that uh, they're a real asset to this summer program, and they've made my job so much easier, so thank you guys. To break the ice a bit, I thought I'd share some fun facts about the associates. Um, really had to pull these facts out of them. Um, don't want to embarrass them, but I thought it would be fun to share, share a little bit about them. So Bio is a rising junior in the philosophy department. And a fun fact about Bio is that he played the bass guitar long enough to learn how to play Beat It by Michael Jackson, and then he quit. Um, <laughs> If I'd known this, I would have asked him to bring a bass in and play uh, at the talent show this summer. So we might have to bring you in in the fall. Um, and then next, we've got Tim Feng, who's a rising sophomore, majoring in operations research and financial engineering. Tim was part of the middle school musical. Why? Because he wanted to impress the girl that he liked. Um, and also, he break danced for the, um, for the dance audition portion of it. Maybe we can get him to dance for us at the reception. What do you think, Tim? <laughs> uh, Crystal Cohen is a rising sophomore in the Woodrow Wilson School, and she is obsessed with all things 80s, movies, music, and fashion. I'm an 80s fan, so I guess I had to know that there was a reason I liked her so much in the interview. Last but not least, we have Savannah McIntosh. Uh, she's a rising junior in the sociology department. And her fun fact is that she uh, enjoys doing sculpture, and her preferred mediums are wood and plaster. I think we're going to have to commission some uh, sculptures for the eLab team soon. And uh, before I hand it over to the teams, I wanted to give one last uh, shout out to my colleague, Madison Epke. I don't know where you are right now, but you, I hope you're in this room. Um, she joined the Keller Center last fall, so this is her first demo day. Um, she has done an amazing job planning this event, um, not to mention making sure everything is run smoothly this entire summer and beyond, um, for that matter. It's a true pleasure working with her, and I want to make sure she's recognized for all the hard work that she's done. So thank you, Madison. I don't know where you are. But... Um, I want to remind everyone that you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and um, post all the photos and, and tag us. And without further ado, please welcome Crystal and Tim. How's everyone doing? Well, welcome to Demo Day 2018. We're so glad that you all can make it out to come and support our up and coming companies in our accelerator. I'm Tim Feng. Um, I'm a rising sophomore, as you've heard, in the oper Operations Research and Financial Engineering Department. And a couple more fun facts. I'm also an Ultimate Frisbee enthusiast and a proud owner of two bunnies. <laughs> and I'm Crystal, a rising sophomore in the Woodrow Wilson School, a Broadway fanatic and a lover of all things chocolate. Uh, behind the scenes, our lovely fellow associates, Savannah and Bio, will be running all things technical. Love you guys. <laughs> 
So Cornelia has done a wonderful job of explaining what the eLab program does. <clears throat> but we'd like to take a moment to share with you what the eLab program means to us. So to the world, the eLab Summer Accelerator is a launch pad for student startups. But to me, eLab represents taking our ideas from the classroom to the real world. It's learning from my peers of diverse backgrounds and interests. Demoing all the amazing products you're about to see before anyone else. Playing ping pong tournaments in the basement of the eHub. Battling the Arctic temperatures of room 115. Rewarding teams for pranking us and the other staff members. And seeing ideas grow, develop, and pivot. And pivot. And pivot. <laughs> so by now we hope you have a good idea of what the eHub was like this summer. You know, it was a lot of laughter, a lot of learning, as well as a lot of stress and a lot of long nights. Through tough decisions and fun times, our uh, teams have all worked incredibly hard these past 10 weeks, and we're so proud of you all. So without further ado, it's our pleasure to officially begin the presentations. As a reminder, each will follow the same format, a short promo video followed by an eight minute pitch and a five minute Q&A session. Uh, please note that during this time, only panelists will be able to ask questions. But uh, what if I have a question, or that guy? <laughs> Don't worry, after all the presentations are over, each team will be happy to answer all of your questions at their demo stations. Oh, awesome. I guess I can finally find out what a, a blockchain is. <laughs> OK, let's get started. Uh, first up is Ketnu, a food company uh, aiming to create an energy bar with the perfect blend of superfoods. Started. Hi, we're Cat New. I'm Jordy. I'm Grace. And I'm Madeline. And we're here to tell you why we're making a superfood energy bar. As active and busy people, we eat a lot of energy bars. But we're bothered by three things. A lack of nutrients, low quality ingredients, and limited superfoods. So, we want to create an energy bar that actually gives you energy. We've created Cat New a superfood energy bar to sustain you no matter what you're doing. So why are we the perfect... Oh, no one gave us the... Why are we the perfect team to do this? Well, we're all competitive athletes with passions for food and nutrition. We've combined these interests into Ketnu. We first created Ketnu for ourselves. We wanted a superior energy bar that was going to last us no matter what we were doing. What's been great is that once people started trying it, they wanted it too. So when we talked to people with, about their snacking options, we found out that a lot of people are not happy customers. According to some market research, 90% of people believe that bar brands do not deliver on the promises that they claim. And we found this problematic. You can also notice this in the media. There's been few really large brands that have had lawsuits on their hands for false advertising or false claims of health. We're not like them. So when we talk to people more about what they want in their bars, we've found the overwhelming majority, 78%, said taste was the number one thing. 
That's why we're creating Ketnu, a brand that delivers a better tasting bar with the best ingredients out there. So we found that high quality energy comes from high quality ingredients. We combine familiar foods with emerging superfoods. Three things that differentiate our bar are our healthy and sustainable protein blend, which is pea protein and cricket flour, and our brain and heart foods, which are coconut oil and flax meal, and last but not least, our fiber and iron powerhouses, chia seeds and quinoa puffs. As you can see, these are just a few of the many superfoods in Ketnu. Okay, I know we all like hearing about the nutrients and ingredients, but taste is supreme. We've developed three distinct flavors at Ketnu. There's Jordy's Berry Pie, Madeline's Coconut Coffee, and My Peanut Brownie. We decided to name each of our distinct flavors after one of our founders to emphasize the fact that at Ketnu, each bar is made by and for real people. But what comes right after uh, tasting a bar and stuff? You wanna make sure it looks good. This is the existing bar market. We've looked at over 50 different bar brands and their packaging and seen a gap in the way things are designed. Ketner's, Ketner's future aesthetic will be a minimalistic package featuring aspirational imagery such as active people. This aligns with Ketnu's brand identity of a food that is made by and for real active people. This imagery also appeals to our target market of young millennials, in iGeneration college students and recent college grads who prioritize in, uh, high quality food. This is the food that's perfect for the busy person no matter what that busyness is. Ketnu is a new generation of food for a next generation of adults. So how are we gonna get Ketnu to the people who are already asking for it? Well, it's pretty simple. We sell either online via our online web store or to stores, um, supermarkets, grocery stores, um, gyms, you name it. And our go-to-market strategy starts here in Princeton, New Jersey by leveraging our local network to increase our visibility on local university shelves and in local food establishments. Our next step is to move to New York, one of the largest food, health food markets in the country. With the final goal of pitching to large institutional vendors uh, that sell to universities and large companies like Aramark and HLA. So we know there are a lot of energy bars out there. Believe me, we've tried them all. So how are we going to stand out on a crowded shelf? Well, we compete with mainstream bars on taste, engineered bars on nutrition, and simple bars on ingredients. And after sampling with hundreds of people, what we found is that what people care about most is taste, nutrients, and ingredients. Also, it doesn't hurt that we have no syrups, gluten, dairy, soy, or GMOs. So let's talk about the financial situation of our company. The energy bar industry is very large. It saw $6.5 billion in sales in 2017, $4 billion of which were just the sale of snack and nutrition bars in the US. In terms of each individual bar, it costs us about $1.20 to manufacture at this point, and we sell those direct to consumer for $2.75 and to, uh, to vendors for $1.75 at wholesale prices. This allows us to achieve a reasonable margin on every single bar we sell. We need your help, however, to get to the next level. So we're asking for funding for one year of operations in the future. We're going to use this money to invest in things like inventory, packaging, production and design, and operation expenses like legal certification. At the end of this year, we hope to be able to, be, to have market traction and have contracts with regional vendors. So why help us get from here to there? Because as we said, 90% of people believe the existing bar market companies do not deliver on their promised claims. We want to address this issue and connect with this next generation of consumer that prioritizes high quality food by delivering on our promises of ingredients, taste, and nutrition, we will be able to bring Ketnu to you so you can bring it on your next adventure. We're Ketnu, a superfood energy bar for and by real people that will both sustain you and satisfy you. Thank you.
question and answer. First of all, great job. <laughs> uh, I saw you trademark the name. Could you talk a little bit about the name and also tell us about how you're going to protect your IP, how you're going to protect your secret formula? So I'll answer the name part. The name we, de we developed, just we made it up. It's a we just wanted something that linguistically sounded right, and then we also felt as if fit the image we were going for. And that's how we came up with Ketnu. And as far as protecting recipe goes, it's a little bit different than a technology in that it isn't, we can't get an IP on that, but it essentially it functions just as a secret recipe. So we have uh, proprietary blends, amounts, and we know what it is, and we share everything that's in it, but we're not giving everyone the recipe to go make it themselves. Can you talk a little bit more about the specifics of your market research? So you talked about this 90% figure, but who did you actually talk to? Was it the millennials you were targeting? And you also mentioned taste tests. Mm -hmm. So just describe a little bit more details on what you went through. Mm -hmm. So thanks. So in terms of the market research, that was based on um, Consumers that were surveyed via sort of an institutional market research firm that um, you know we you paid money for a 60-page report. So this is this is sort of large scale. I think two or three thousand people, 90% um, of which consume bars. Uh, so that's where that market research set, uh, came from. Um, in terms of taste testing, goes, so we bring it everywhere we go. So we've had eight-year-olds trying it. We've had people on national sports teams trying it. We've had people in offices trying it. So throughout the summer, we've just been having everyone who we interact with. Some people are at first are curious whether they want a new bar in their life. They're like, oh, I eat this or I eat that. But after they've tried it, they love it. So that's why we're up here today. And we have demos for all of you yes. outside of our demo <laughs> stage. We have samples, so you can. <laughs> so uh, you can everybody should try a bar. Uh, again, great job on the presentation, uh, good pacing and everything. Uh, my question is, uh, if you need to do more than three flavors, do you need to find more founders? <laughs> so, Maybe just more investors or something, yeah. <laughs> so is that, is that up for option, then uh, the highest investor gets the name on the next bar? Is maybe, that what's maybe, uh, maybe our highest funding option on a Kickstarter will be uh, you get a bar flavor. There we go, okay. You have to earn the flavor. So a uh, quick question for you guys. Who put the video together? Who's running the marketing and design? The, the two of us yeah, put it together. Excellent, excellent job in the <laughs> Thank video. You. Uh, you got everyone here excited. A great way to, to kick off Demo Day. Thank you. Um, so you, you kind of listed three different segments of the market and of the bar market. And one segment is, has taste as the preferential decision-making factor. One has ingredients and one has nutrition. Um, if those are three segments and they operate like three different customer segments, which segment are you going for or are you trying to consolidate the market and beat all of these players at their own game? So it's a good question. I guess the best way to break it down is that no matter what people's second preference was, whether it was nutrition, whether it was ingredients, taste was always number one. Hmm. So we've really been, our first focus was get the taste with the ingredients we want. And so I would say that the taste is what pe keeps people coming back and the ingredients and the nutrients is what gets people interested. I think that's very interesting. Uh, so you started out the presentation with this concept that people feel uh, that bars aren't living up to their promises. Mm -hmm. And so one piece of feedback I'll give you is that you're gonna have to make the decision between a very, very clear vision for the company. Is it that you are living up to your promises and no one else is? Or is it that you have better taste, better ingredients, and better energy? Because those are two separate visions, mm -hmm. right? One can be secondary, one can be primary, but that's an important decision to make. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank Great you. job, guys. New York, you said, is the market you're going to go into after Prince. I understand Princeton. Uh -huh. New York seems like a tough market to break into. So help us understand why, why New York of anywhere you could potentially introduce this. So one market that we're definitely looking into is going B to C. So direct to companies who are providing snacks for the people who are working for them. So our bar is really balanced energy. It's meant for people doing different activities. And so we see that that, as far as New York is full of companies of all different sizes, and we see as that could be just one new place that would be different from what we're targeting in Princeton. And I think also New York allows us to utilize the already growing network of mentors and advisors that are largely New York and Princeton based. 
Yeah. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Thank you. I need to get more samples. Huh? Haven't you had five already? Yeah, but that blend of superfoods is delicious and healthy. Give me more of Jordy's berry pie, all right? <laughs> anyway, next up is Afari, who's creating a blockchain-based social network aiming to give data privacy back to the people. I have the right to put my data, a name on my data, and share it with somebody. I do not believe we have the right to do that. Do you have the ability? Senator, the data is in the system. Do so you have the ability? Technically, I think someone could do that, but that would be a massive breach. On Afari, your data isn't kept by us but by you, in storage that you own. So you can do all the things that you love, like spread ideas, like memes, share memories, all with the peace of mind that your data won't be abused. Data ownership and privacy is pretty great, but don't take our word for it. See what Afari users say. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Haftar. I'm one of the co-founders of Afari, and I'm here with my two co-founders, Richard and Felix. And today, we want to talk to you about social media. Now, every day, six billion people post posts on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. What this tells us is that social media has become the main vehicle through which we discover, share, and create information with people that we care about. But social media, as it stands, is broken. And there's three reasons why. The first is that we've lost trust in social media companies to protect our data and our privacy. They own our data, they store it on their servers, and they control who accesses it. Look no further than the recent Cambridge Analytica scandal for why lack of data ownership and protection of our privacy is harmful. Secondly, despite social media being vital to communication in today's age, uh, not everyone gets an equal chance for their voice to be heard. Platform censorship by companies like Facebook and Twitter, as well as government censorship by countries like Vietnam, means that people are either scared to freely share their ideas, or that certain points of view are left out of the marketplace of ideas. And thirdly, creators are not properly rewarded. Social media companies make billions of dollars in ad revenue from data that we users create. But unless you're Casey Nestiat or some other high profile YouTuber, we're not rewarded for our creative pursuits. All of this needs to change. So we introduce to you Afari, which is a decentralized social media platform that puts you, the user, first. As you have seen in our opening video, Afari is currently in the, opening, uh, in the public beta, and our users love the freedom and safety that we provide. Our vision for Afari is to make a decentralized platform that, put, that allows users to have control over their data and privacy, as well as getting rewarded for creating content that other people love. To pursue that vision, we are starting with features that allow users to have more data ownership, as well as having protection against unjust censorship, and our system works as follows. When you post on Afari, your data is not stored with us, but rather it is stored in your storage system that you own. To make this happen, we use a decentralized storage and naming system called BlockSack that we are in partnership with. Also, when someone wants to access your data, you control what kind of data they can access and, what they can, uh, and how much they can see. And what that ultimately allows you to do is to have fine-grained control over what outside entities can see. So our initial target market is privacy and free speech advocates, as well as people facing unjust censorship in countries like Vietnam. While this market may seem niche, it's actually fairly large and estimated to be around $30 billion, with the added benefit of a passionate and dedicated user base that will resonate with Afari's values of privacy, security, and data ownership. In the next phase of growth, we plan on targeting the multi-billion dollar industry of digital content creators and consumers. This market is estimated to be around $180 billion 
but we project it might be slightly more since this value is highly influenced by YouTube, which rewards only the top 1% of digital content creators. Our platform, Afari, will reward all content creators, both small and large, giving us a much larger market, a total addressable market. This brings us to step three of the Afari vision, which is the token reward network. Our platform, Afari, will have a cryptographic token, which will be used in three main ways. The first is they'll be used by content creators to purchase premium features that will allow them to better understand, engage, and reach their audience. The second is they'll be used by advertisers to purchase ads on our platform. Now, ads on Afari are done differently from traditional platforms in that the only information advertisers get to use to decide which ads they show you are informations that you, are, you explicitly have opted in to show them, making, helping us preserve your privacy and security as we intend to do. And last but not least, our platform will be, our token will be used by content consumers to reward their favorite content creators, as well as purchase subscriptions that will give them access to exclusive content and allow them to opt out of ads. The token plays a huge role in our monetization strategy. We will make money in two main ways. The first is through token appreciation, and the second is by taking a cut on the transactions that occur within our network. Most of the transaction revenue generated through transactions is given back to the people who make the platform valuable, which is the user. Now that you've heard about our vision, we'd like to introduce ourselves and tell you about how far we've come. So I'm Richard, and I lead product and protocol design. I'm Aftar, and I deal with marketing, operations, and investor relations. Uh, and I'm Felix, and I deal with technology and engineering. We are three computer science graduates from here at Princeton University. We have research experience in blockchain technology and uh, specifically blockchain applications and security, as well as distributed systems through our work with some of the top professors in the, in the nation. We also have industrial experience as program manager and software engineers through our work at big corporations like Microsoft and growth stage uh, startups like Andela. We are also supported by two amazing engineers in May and Sion. Specifically, May is a winner of the Shapiro Prize, which is an, an academic award given to top 5% of students in your class. And Sion is a gold medalist in the International Math Olympiads. As a team, we have the technical skills, the industrial experience, as well as the operational grit to make a product that users will love and enjoy, as well as creating a company that will attract top talent from all over the world. But as students and recent graduates, we recognize our limitations, and that's why we've done our best to surround ourselves with a world-class team of advisors, four of which you see on the screen in front of you. We have people like Mike Friedman, who's a distributed systems professor here at Princeton, Naval Ravikant, who's the CEO uh, of AngelList and co-founder of Metastable, as well as an early, early investor in Twitter. On the strategy side, we have Pardon Makumbe, who's a managing partner at CRE Venture Capital and advisor to crypto company Basis. And then last but certainly not least, we have Princeton entrepreneurship legend, the man who made Princeton, um, entrepreneurship at Princeton possible, Ed Shao, helping us with business development. Now, we've made a ton of progress on Afari since we started working on it earlier this year in our Princeton dorm, in our Princeton dorm rooms. We've won a number of entrepreneurship competitions, most notably coming first out of 300 teams at the, the international Tiger Launch competition and we've also got a partnership with Blockstack, who you may remember as the blockchain-based naming and storage system, the piece of infrastructure that we're building on top of to make all the privacy and security benefits possible. Blockstack is a hugely reputable name in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space, and we're really proud to be working closely with them on growth and engineering concerns. Now, as uh, Felix told you, we launched Safari to the public last week Friday after working on it for 10 weeks here in the eLab. And so far, we have over 1,200 connections made on the platform, 524 posts, and around uh, 195 users using the platform, with another 426 of them on the wait list for our mobile application. On the fundraising side, we already raised and closed $100,000 from the Blockstack Signature Fund um, and gotten into an incubator program with Blockstack, which we're going to do next. And we also qualify for an additional 100K of investment from the Princeton Alumni Entrepreneurship Fund, which will help Felix, Richard, and I work on Afari uh, and keep growing it as we're working on Afari full time now that we've graduated from Princeton. The ask that we have for you today is very simple. If you're an investor and you're passionate about Bitcoin and blockchain technology, we'd love for you to help us to take Afari to the next level and help us achieve the milestones of building out our mobile application hiring key personnel, as well as building out the first version of our token network. We're also hiring in engineering and business roles, so if you'd like to work with Afari, email us at hello at afari.io. 
But most importantly, we'd love for you to join Afari as an early user. So sign up now at www.afari.io and help us on our journey to create social media that puts you, the user, in control. Thank you. Thank you, Afari. We'll now move into Q&A. Congratulations on an excellent pitch, gentlemen. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting the three of you at the UPitch event at, I believe it was Montclair State University. And, and so I, I will say that your, your pitch was already excellent then, and you've improved it even further. Um, however, that day I did ask you a question. I don't know if you recall. And you didn't have an answer that day, but you thought about it. The question was, so was, it's insinuated in the slides here, that your, your platform, your decentralized blockchain or block stack platform will make it so that censorship will not be controlled by a single agency around your network. You won't necessarily have to censor. The question that I asked you is whether or not all censorship is inherently bad. Um, so we actually remember your question very well. Um, <laughs> you've done a lot of thinking since that day. Um, as we saw you walk in, we knew that question was gonna be asked again. <laughs> So, Our smart guys. <laughs> Our goal with Afari is not to build a digital wild west where anyone can do anything with any, without any accountability. Um, as people of color, we're acutely aware of the possibility of these platforms become, to become tools for spreading hate. In fact, on Friday when we launched our app, um, someone referred to us as stupid brown people. And we know that had it not been for possibly moderation, um, tools put in place by Twitter, they would probably use something way harsher. Um, so we understand that moderation is useful and it, it keeps these platforms safe. The problem with um, censorship and moderation we're trying to solve is twofold. The first is unjust government censorship, where governments can strong arm centralized companies to host their data within their legal bounds so that they can have legal jurisdiction over them to regulate and survey the content that comes through these platforms. Um, a, a similar situation is happening in Vietnam right now with Facebook yeah. forcing Viet Vietnam forcing Facebook to build um, servers in Vietnam so that the Vietnam government could actually monitor the content coming through from the Vietnam citizens. Um, and we believe that this shouldn't be done in any government. And governments that try to survey users to this extent aren't doing a good job. Um, so we solve this problem by first using encryption um, and secondly by allowing users to store their data in their own personalized storage systems. But picking up from, from Richard's uh, first, uh, first point about censorship, the second point is that you need to realize that because companies like Facebook and Twitter serve billions of, and billions of people in the world, they've moved from becoming these cute little Silicon Valley startups and essentially performing the job of like public utilities for communication for every single person that uses the internet. And we think that like, uh, monopolies are bad because like, these, uh, these, these uh, companies have a, uh, too much of control over what's said on these platforms. Now, we realize that like, as the internet is becoming increasingly global, more people need to be represented. And so the essence of our moderation policy is that the users of the platform should be given a much larger voice over what kind of content is uh, allowed and what's not allowed on the platform. We're all for banning things that like, people agree are morally, morally reprehensible, but we think that like, in the edge cases whereby, for example, um, like what's happening with right now in Vietnam, like, governments uh, shouldn't have that ability to uh, survey and uh, illegally uh, perform surveillance on people, and also that people should be allowed to engage in debates in, in this marketplace of ideas, and if people are okay with it and they agree that the rules of the network is this, then uh, that's what's going to go on. It's a very difficult topic, and like, this is something we're going to think a lot about, but like, that gives you an idea of like, how much we've thought about this already. To add on to that, actually, the, um, so the, as after a thing, the problem we're trying to solve is single party censorship, which is where one, one company, as in Twitter or Facebook, gets to decide exactly what happens, what everyone can share and say on their platform. We believe this is not right, and um, if you, to put this in a more real life situation, is akin to monarchs deciding exactly what rules everyone in their country should follow. And we know how those things like that go. Um, we've currently devised a system that allows the community and us as a platform together to moderate content. Um, and we will be writing a Medium post, which I think you should all follow our Medium account if you're interested in knowing how this works, 
um, that will explain how the system works and how it ensures that content on the platform is safe for people to consume. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad to see that your views have evolved on that and, and dealing with these challenges before they rear their ugly head on your network is a great idea. Excellent progress, gentlemen. Yeah, um, so many questions I would, I, would, I would love to ask, but I'll keep it, keep it quick and, and talk to you afterwards. But um, uh, congratulations on, on the success that you've seen so far. Um, uh, the, my question is on centering on, on using, using blockchain as the means of actually storing, storing the content, all that kind of stuff. Yes, now you've avoided the centralized databases maybe of, of Twitter or Facebook that are actually storing that, and now it's more distributed. But uh, it's still, it appears to me that Afari is still a, a single uh, a single point of, of uh, leverage or attack um, where it could do that. Have you published uh, in an open source manner the means by which the content is being stored so if Afari is targeted, someone else can uh, actually come up and, and still be able to use that content and, and communicate? Yeah, so maybe I can say a few words about that. So essentially what, what happens is that we, we are sort of uh, like uh, in computer science terms used like as a content delivery network. So users put their uh, data in the user control storage like I've explained before. And we're in the middle where we aggregate content from each user so that we feed it to those who want to see that content. So as you said, we're kind of, we're kind of in a situation where if uh, the US government seems that they want to drop or block our network, what they can do, they can just uh, block our IP addresses so that we cannot give that content. Or if someone can, if, uh, also in a situation where uh, users will need to, try, to trust in some sense that we are giving the data that they want. So essentially what we're trying to do is that uh, our, our aggregator or the data, the way the system that is going to be used for delivering content to the users is going to be open source. So what that enables us to do is that anyone can spin up their own server and their own aggregator to check that we are observing the rules that we set up for ourselves. And we do not have an incentive to lie because in that case we'll be shooting ourselves in the foot. Thank you so much. Thank you. What are you doing? I'm checking my feed on Afari. The, the content creators on here are great. I'm sure they are, but we're a little busy right now. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so next up we have Alira Infrared Biosensing, who is creating a laser that, that uses, um, that becomes a sensor that non-invasively detects biomarkers. Let's take a moment to think about what matters most in our world. Our bodies, our air, our food. Throughout our history, we have been striving to engineer ways to make these better. But the first step in being able to engineer is to understand. And to understand, we must first observe. At Alira, we are developing a tool to do just this. Our sensor, which has been developed at Princeton University over the past decade, will give doctors, scientists, and everyday people a new eye in which to observe the world enabling them to better our health, clean our air, and protect our food and drinks from contaminants, and maybe make things a bit tastier in the process. We can do this with Miri, our mid-infrared eye. I'm Alex Worth, the CEO and co-founder of Alira Infrared Biosensing. I hope that our video gave you a sense of how um, observing the world and observing the world specifically using light um, can really create a lot of progress. And the idea of using light for sensing is nothing new. It was actually in the 1850s uh, that scientists like Leon Foucault uh, first discovered that you could def differentiate uh, different materials by the amount of light that they absorbed. And since then, the field of spectroscopy and optics has vastly grown. We now use lasers to look for water on Mars, to detect gravitational waves, and do high-precision um, surgeries in hospitals. 
At Alira, we're taking this a step further by bringing this hi these high precision spectrometers out of the lab and into your hands. We do this with MIRI, our mid-infrared eye. So what we have here is a mid-infrared quantum cascade laser that is very high power. The light being sent interacts with molecules, and then we have a high throughput uh, collection mechanism which collects the, this information and funnels it to intelligent machine learning algorithms which can predict the molecular concentrations. What this provides is continuous and non-contact sensing. You don't need to interact with the material that you're looking at. Um, it provides selective and sensitive measurements of a wide variety of molecules, as well as being user-friendly and robust. With a single click, you're able to get all the information you want from your material, and uh, it's handheld and portable. You can bring it right onto the production floor. But probably most importantly, our platform technology is extremely versatile, which means that it can be applied to a wide range of markets and applications. The first industry that we're looking to enter uh, is the wine industry. Now, uh, this might seem odd uh, to some of you because of how the wine industry has historically relied on the refined senses of veteran winemakers to make high quality wines. But actually, throughout the past century, uh, the wine industry has become very technologically and scientifically advanced. But one thing that they're still missing is a fast, convenient, and accurate sensor to measure the molecular content of wine. We can do that with MIRI. And not only that, we can completely streamline the entire process from grape to glass. Uh, currently, uh, winemakers use things like wet chemistry or bulky desktop uh, tabletop spectrometers. Uh, wet chemistry tends to be very tedious. And, uh, and can some of the experiments and, and tests can take days to get the results back. Uh, the other spectrometers that are out there on the market uh, tend to have contamination issues and therefore lack in the accuracy. Our sensor can do all of this and more. Plus, its portability, again, will allow us to bring it in every step of the process from grape to glass. When winemakers first bring the grapes into the system, we're going to be able to measure the molecular content of the grape juice. The grape juice is then moved to fermentation tanks. This is a very critical process, and we're going to be able to do frequent measuring with Miri throughout the entire step of the way. The wine is then moved to aging barrels, and with Miri, we're going to be able to look inside every single barrel. And last but not least, the wine bottling production line. We're going to be able to bring Miri into the production line and look at every single bottle. Now, just to really drive this message home and paint a picture of how this specifically will help winemakers um, is the example of acetic acid. Now, acetic acid is a very small molecule that can cause big problems for winemakers. And the winemakers that we've spoken to have expressed that if you catch acetic acid starting to form in your wine, acetic acid turns you know, high-quality wines into vinegar, which is highly undesirable. Um, if you catch it early, it's a very simple thing to fix. But if you let it skyrocket out of control, this problem will cost tens of thousands of dollars. So having a convenient, portable system that allows for more frequent measuring will allow you to stop this before it becomes a problem. In result, we're going to save winemakers time, money, and improve the quality of their wines. Now, we take this a step further, too, by having a multifaceted business model that will ensure initial revenue and uh, value creation. So we do this by first providing a mobile service. So again, our system is so robust, we can put it on the back of a truck. We're going to have a mobile service um, where we provide uh, sensing and, and uh, diagnostics for winemakers who um, don't currently have the infrastructure to do this sort of sensing themselves. Um, subsequently, we're going to be able to retrofit the current infrastructure of wineries um, in order to have a single sensor which can now measure all of their tanks and barrels. Lastly, for large winemakers who want to do continuous monitoring, we can build custom systems to meet their very needs. Now, I just want to remind you, the wine market is just one small piece where we're first entering. But we have a very versatile sensor and an adaptable business plan, which will allow us to expand into many different markets, including first entering other liquors, 
food, and eventually entering into the healthcare industry, which spends billions of dollars every year on these kinds of sensing and diagnostics. Now, this might sound like a big challenge, uh, but we have a star team to do it. We are a team of Princeton scientists and entrepreneurs who specialize in things like spectroscopy, uh, laser and detector fabrication, as well as machine learning algorithms, the backbone of our technology. And we have gotten proven traction. So far, we've uh, been given grants by both Princeton and the um, New Jersey Health Foundation, totaling $150,000, as well over the past year, winning a series of pitch competitions um, with winnings totaling over $30,000. So what we need now is for you to join us. Join us as part of our group of beta customers to help accelerate this production process, as well as to join us to bring high precision spectroscopy out of the labs and into your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Alira. And now for Q&A. So great job. Uh, so this was incredibly interesting, and I uh, would love for you to go a little bit more into why you chose wine as the first use case. So I'm in the yeah. healthcare uh, industry, and I really understand how that would fit there. Uh, and I'm just curious if you've actually worked out the economics of doing a pilot in a winery, and if you know that they'll actually pay for this. Yeah. So um, you know, we've we've gone out and well, to answer your first question, why we chose wine, uh, we've actually we were approached by people in the industry who said, this is. The, this will be really good for what we need. Um, and it turns out the wine industry, compared to other food markets, et cetera, have less, and of course healthcare as well, has, have a lot less regulation. And they have a lot of interest in this sort of technological and scientific equipment. They're, they're sort of science nerds like us. So, <laughs> so we can relate um, in that way. In terms of the economics, um, it is, it's a, again, a smaller market, um, but definitely something that a lot of people are excited about and we've given them, so our system is um, going to, we've priced it similar to um, the sort of commercial wine testing spectrometers that are on the market, which is about $100,000. Um, and they've sold you know, to many wineries across the world and uh, we see that as a very competitive uh, market for us as well. Yeah. Uh Nice presentation. I think, though, um, maybe a piece of feedback. It took you a long time to get to the problem. Uh -huh. um, and so I might want to encourage you in, in future presentations to, you know, that 10,000, that, that was a nice, that was a nice, note. I mean, the, the acetic acid problem seems like a real problem. It is, yeah. It took you a long time to, so you didn't, you hooked me then. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just a suggestion about, you know, start with the problem, start with the market. When you talk about versatile to investors, they're not really into that because yeah. they want to know what specific problem are you solving and who's, who's the person who's going to pay that to right. solve that right, problem. Right. So just a, a piece of advice, but um, it's, it's hard with sort of a sophisticated technology to get to that point, so yeah. good job. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciated the, the kind of the history lesson and, and, and the, the reasoning behind this. Yeah. Uh, I also really appreciated that it, it seems like, uh, again, to the uh, initial comments, like this could be used in a, a, a number of use cases, and I appreciate that you have focused in on a particular segment. Yeah. Um, my one follow-up question is, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, a, a part of this is actually feeding this into a machine learning system. What, what part does that play as opposed, I, I would have expected it's just like, okay, here are the numbers, they're in the right range or not in the right yeah. range. What does the ML part yeah, do? Yeah, so um, this is actually one of the, you know, the biggest distinguishers of our technology. So the first is that we have a mid-infrared laser, which is a fairly new technology. And the second is combining that with the machine learning algorithms. So what this allows us to do is look at and understand the molecular content of materials that people previously never thought it was possible to do. And those are very complex materials with a lot of very long chain polymers, et cetera, and they just want to know um, sort of the information about these more simple molecules. If you use another light range or if you don't use the machine learning algorithms, your technology is not going to be as adaptable. Um, so in, with the wine market as an example, uh, each type of wine actually has a 
pretty different structure or the location it is or et cetera. So building a system that can do everything with one system um, is quite challenging. But with the improvements in machine learning algorithms, uh, we're going to be able to do that. And, and can you, uh, if you train it up on, with one winery, can you apply those to another exactly. winery and that's exactly. all cool? Exactly, all right. yeah. So really interesting innovation here. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the the go-to-market strategy for approaching the different vineyards and winemakers and, yeah. and how quickly you plan to roll out. Right. So um, I think that our go-to-market strategy also kind of, or at least ours, um, aligns with our graduation dates as well. Um, the <laughs> the uh, group of us are, uh, well, the three of us are all PhD students. I'm actually a fifth, rising fifth-year PhD student. So. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> the, uh, I should graduate in about a year. So we're going to do a year more of product development with the help of some of the academic grants that we've gotten and um, do some initial testing with some winemakers that we've already spoken to in the local area. And then after that, we plan to la launch our mobile service. So this will create validation within the wine winery field or the, the wine field um, that our product actually can work while still enabling us to do some more product development and kind of um, fine tune our system to meet their, their needs. So are you raising capital? Are we raising, are you raising capital? capital currently? Uh, we're not currently looking for investment. Um, we're looking for academic grants. No. Well, thank you. Sounds like a good way to get some free wine samples. <laughs> Sounds like groundbreaking technology. Okay, sorry. Well, next up we have TerraViews, a marketing company that's building virtual reality shopping experiences for outdoor gear. Yeah, I just got to the store. I got our gear list. Do we really need everything on this? All right. I'll go get it. <laughs> yes. Hey, how can I help you? I just need all this camping gear by this weekend, and I have no idea where to go. Okay, cool. Well, we can definitely help you. Why are you trying this? So anyone in the room who's ever gone on a camping, fishing, hiking, or hunting or skiing trip knows this story all too well. You walk into the store and you're excited for the adventure, and immediately you're lost in a sea of complicated outdoor gear. The page-long product descriptions are in a foreign language. No one can understand them. And in the end, you either buy the cheapest thing on the shelf or whatever the sales associate told you to. This is why we created TerraViews, a virtual reality shopping assistant that makes preparing for every kind of adventure easy, fast, and entertaining. We immerse the customers in an unforgettable journey and then show them exactly what they need to get out and do the real thing. Our team, our team is made out of four Princeton University students <laughs> who have the unique and precise skill set to start this business. Joe is a professional videographer with a background in 360 video techniques. Lucas is a software developer with an academic focus in graphics. And Kobe is, has experience in both business development and design thinking. 
My name is Amin and I'm a Utah native who has a passion and a lot of experience in all things pertaining to the outdoors. Our 25 plus years of combined experience is what has enabled us to go from an idea to a live product launch in just eight weeks. So in short, TerraViews is all about great customer experience because 89% of retail businesses are competing on this one factor alone. If you can't provide your customers with something really special, they're gonna go to someone who can, or they're gonna log on to Amazon and get everything they need. But the challenge is that providing experience at the point of sale is very difficult. You can put up a full-size rock wall, but it's gonna cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of staff hours to operate and to maintain. Additionally, the rock wall is cool and may draw customers into the store, but it doesn't necessarily affect their purchasing activity or help them make more informed decisions. So we put our heads together and we said, how can we create something that creates an awesome customer experience while at the same time help customers make more sales? We offer a platform that puts users in an immersive, custom VR shopping experience. Using headsets in store, we can show products in the outdoor context that really makes them shine. Our platform delivers content curated for every adventure. Want to see what you need for your next hike? TerraViews will show you. Using our uh, VR technology, we can uh, deliver content um, for every adventure, like I said, <laughs> and uh, um, give the users the experience they want, deliver the gear directly to them, and show them exactly what they need to see. So TerraViews is unique in that we offer a full stack production. We do everything from storyboarding and filming to uh, overlaying our proprietary technology to delivering the headsets in store. As an added bonus, all of our 360 video content is shareable on any form of social media that supports it. <coughs> and our, our VR adventures have a variety of use cases, from in-store to trade shows to company events and even pop-up shops. So what we're calling an experience is an interactive VR adventure featuring 15 or more products. Uh, a rafting trip, for example, could feature life jacket and paddle gear. For end users, it's a unique and fun way to shop for gear. And for businesses, it's an attraction they can add to their stores at a good cost that draws in customers. In addition, we're currently testing with our partners a full analytics suite so that our business partners can see exactly what their customers are looking at and for. So we didn't just choose the outdoor market because it's something we're passionate about and that suits our skills. It's also a huge industry. We're in America alone they're spending $48 billion on outdoor gear and apparel each year, with 11 billion outdoor adventures happening every year in the United States. But some people still don't know how to get outdoors, so we see room for growth in this market, where 68% of retailers are focusing on experiential marketing in their 2020 marketing strategy. Now, we do have some early traction in this market, where we've secured two partnerships in a mere six weeks. One with Ramsey Outdoor, Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, a local New Jersey retailer uh, of outdoor gear and products, and another in Cotopaxi, a Salt Lake City headquartered brand that's nationally recognized and sold in retailers around the globe. Our business strategy is subscription based, where companies pay an initial fee for the cost of the creation and then a 10% per month per store fee on top of that. The numbers that you see on the screen above are based off our recent trip to Utah to shoot for Cotopaxi, where we estimated the cost around $5,000 with a recurring monthly fee per store of $500. We also estimate that these experiences will be around six months in lifespan with general product rotation in the outdoor industry, which gives us a low price that keeps customers coming back and gives us a very good recurring revenue stream. As for our financial projections, it's all based off the number of experiences we can create and the size of the companies that we're able to partner with. For those reasons, in 2019, we aim to have 18 experiences launched and live. And in 2020, we aim to have 36 experiences, 2021, 60 experiences, with a corresponding revenue of $6.3 million in that year, 2021, in the outdoor industry alone. But we don't just see ourselves as an outdoor company. We see a lot of applications for our interactive and entertaining platform, especially in the kitchen and cookware, the athletic apparel, and the furnishings market, where our platform could be used for a wide range of use cases. 
As for the future of TerraViews, we're currently raising our seed round and we'd love it if you'd join us. We're, we're launching our seed round so that we can gain high er, higher key personnel and grow our customer acquisition. We'll also be focusing on developing our technology. We'll be entering new industries and we'll be launching a consumer facing product which will allow people to shop from their headsets in home, get products delivered directly to their door and allow us to take a cut of revenue off sales that'll greatly accelerate our growth. With that, we'd ask that you join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, TerraViews. Nice job. Um, so maybe this is more of a su suggestion, but it might lead to a question. Um, um, I've faced a situation of having a list from a, like an outdoor um, uh, uh, trip leader, like so going on more of an organized outdoor trip and saying, okay, you have to buy these 10 things. <laughs> um, and I, again, sort of have no clue and I go to an REI and I have no idea where to start. And I'm just wondering if you would thought about that as a channel to market. So, um, or, and so where my question is really these experiences that you're building, you need like a lot of different kinds of gear and is one manufacturer like the, the company in Utah going to be able to have enough variety in their offering to be able to show a full experience. I guess maybe I didn't quite understand that part. So um, yeah, that's a valid concern. Like for example, with Cotopaxi, it's more of a lifestyle brand. So you can show some traveling, some hiking, maybe some camping, but not river rafting. And this is why some of our ideal clients are the big ones like REI, Big Bass Pro Shops, the ones that have all the gear necessary for every adventure. Those are our, those are our ideal clients. But Still, it's a great way for every kind of company to market what they have in their store. Great job. Uh, the videos were incredible, and you did an incredible job getting to the problem right away. So thank you so much. Um, I have a question. How, uh, what kind of technology risks do you have here? So like, do you, when, you, when the customers bought something, how are you uh, giving that information to the store immediately? So is it Wi-Fi enabled? How are, you, how are you doing that? And how do you plan to get around the problems that you might hit the first year? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So right now, um, our integrations uh, with our current partnerships are uh, purely on uh, marketing focused. Uh, so our checkout functionality actually isn't live yet, but um, we plan to go live with that soon. Uh, currently, it's Wi-Fi enabled. So uh, the Oculus headsets have, uh, the, the ones we're using, have um, no connections. You can just put them on, and they can connect to the Wi-Fi network um, in the store. So with that, we also pl um, have a, our plan to have a corresponding um, app that, that can be downloaded onto, um, onto any device, and uh, we can send information via that. Um, but uh, like I said, we, we just, uh, we're eight weeks in, so, so um, we're just starting okay. to have that. You still purchase the checkout counter, don't Yeah. It sends a notification of the items, and then you check out the counter. Yeah. Um, it's uh, really cool. and, and from what I could tell on that, and I look forward to, to going up and, and seeing some more of it, it looks like this is kind of an on-rails experience where you're going through in, in, in production. And one of the things that I was thinking, like, oh, this would be so cool in VR that you could actually see the products in context, and so it would be more of an AR kind of an experience uh, where, where you would do that. But it, it seems like at this point, at least, it's kind of on-rails. You have a set number of products that are there. It's not like I can change that tent to see what the different sizes are um, at this point. Um, so I guess that wasn't, a, I was just confirming is that, that right now that's the case. Uh, so um, uh, my two comments are, uh, one is uh, I'm sure uh, when, you, when you showed the video and you had actual people experiencing it, like um, just make sure you distinguish between those that are having their first ever VR experience and opening their eyes as opposed to your particular offering. Just kind of dig into that a little bit. And then secondly, uh, since the production is, is um, you know, a big part of this, how, how do you anticipate scaling your company to actually meet those production needs? Yeah, so we actually, we're hoping on hiring more videographers as the demand grows through the outdoor industry. But um, as, as for our production itself, it's really not incredibly expensive to do. The, the, the GoPro has created GoPro Fusion 360 cameras, which I'm not sure if you've heard, is destroying GoPro at this point for anybody other than 360 video creators, which is not as popular right now. So the cost of creation for a lot of these experiences is actually really low, which allows us to get into stores very easily. But that's, that's currently what we're focused on. Just uh, overall, really great guys. Um, I, I like the go-to-market strategy. It's really clean. 
I, we, you know, you can see you executing on the business. The quick question here, which is kind of a dovetailing off of Eric's question. It seems like AR would make this video production infinitely more scalable because then you could literally swap in and out products on the fly. You know, I don't like that backpack. I want to see it in green and with a, I don't know, more lumbar support. Yeah. Is that a part of the plan? So that, that is part of our future strategy. We're lucky that our outdoor expert is also a phenomenal 3D modeling expert. So. Uh, yeah, and, and on the AR, um, so uh, Apple's really pushing the AR thing, and, and it's really hot, and um, yeah. we've definitely looked in that space a lot, and uh, we, trust me, we wanted to make it happen. The hardware side of this, the hardware providers for AR, it's not there yet. When's the last time, like, other than like Pokemon Go, like people really use AR apps? It's because they're not that great yet, and the hardware isn't there yet, and um, we're sort of cautiously watching that, that space to sort of see it grow. But if we're not gonna deliver a A plus experience every time someone puts on our, our headset or looks at our app, then it's not worth it for us. Great, really clean plan. Good, good, good work, guys. You can get a uh, Magic Leaf, the uh, death kit. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so oh, much oh. for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know, I'm not much of an outdoors person, but this changes things. I might have to give camping a try. That's great. Uh, can I come? No. <laughs> I'll remember this. And speaking of memories, next up we have Lumha. A, me Thank you. <laughs> a memory collection and engagement company designed to increase happiness. All right. My name is Shreya Saxera. I'm the founder and CEO of Lamha. And today I'm here to tell you why I hope you join the Lamha community, either as a user or an advisor or in whatever part you seem fit. So instead of doing problem solution, I thought we'd do something a little different since we're so much about memories and stories. I'm going to start off with a story and then our flagship product, followed by the main application of our product right now. So Lamha really started about two and a half, three years ago, roughly, during one of my summers from Princeton, where I was writing a book about terminally ill children below the poverty line in India. To write this book, I spent quite a while living with them. And unfortunately, these children passed away before the book was published. This made me feel really helpless. So I went home and put together drawings I had these children made, voice notes from talking to them, different things they'd made for me, and found these jars my grandmom had lying around her house, 
filled all of these little memories I had with the children and mailed out the jars to the families. Having these jars was something the families really appreciated. Starting with this, I then continued building these memory jars for different groups of people. I worked with army units around the world, senior citizens with different diseases, and a lot of different groups of people until the psychology major in me said, hold on, there's something going on here. These memory jars seem to make people really happy. Why? So then, for my senior thesis at Princeton, I studied this phenomenon of memory jars. I worked with 120 Princeton seniors, as well as more than a few hundred residents from 11 homes in New Jersey, and had them all make memory jars, and then come back a month later and either read their own jars or someone else's jars. What we found was that both making and reading these jars made people really happy, reduced how lonely they felt, and made them feel like they had an increased sense of purpose in life. So all of this was really exciting, and it was a great product, a great experience, I'd hoped. But what really drove me to try to create an actual venture out of this was the experience that I had with the senior citizens. I met somebody whose only memories were serving for Nazi Germany during World War II. I spoke with a woman who was married to three people in the 1940s in New York. And just hearing all of these stories made me feel like I was living a thousand lives. And the senior citizens said that they were feeling heard for the first time in a very long time. And nobody was actually trying to collect these stories. This is what drove me to try to create Lamha, to try to find a way to really scale the experience I was having in conversation and that the senior citizens were having in feeling heard. We decided to start with a mobile app and website that we launched about two weeks ago. It has two main parts to it. The first is actually creating your own memory jars. So you enter a few details about your memories, and then you can create your own jar. So you could create a family tree, for example, and then invite all of your family members to contribute memories into your own space. We have a Princeton-wide one for any of you who want to contribute to that. Um, you can also see your memories, scroll through them in this way. Or one of my personal favorite features is the memory walk, where as you walk by places memories are created in, they pop up on your phone. Finally, you can choose to filter memories from around the world. So let's say you're all at Demo Day feeling super excited about being in part two of it. You could choose your emotion to be excitement, and then you could pin your location to be a university. And exciting memories that people have logged from around the world at universities will come up on your phone if they chose to share them. So given that we launched two weeks ago, let's look at how we've been doing. We've got a couple of hundred users from over 60 countries that are using Lamha right now. And it's not just that they come to Lamha and then forget about it. 45% of our users actually come back every day. And it's not like they come back for 30 seconds either. On average, a user spends nine minutes on Lamha. So this is something that they take pretty seriously in their day. And it's not just that we have a few people who are loyal to it. We also have a lot of new users joining us week on week. So how are people using Lamha? We've seen Lamha be used for special occasions like graduation, where they log memories from that. We've seen people log family memories and things of legacy. We've seen people record trips using Lamha. We've seen them record sports teams and statistics. We've seen people actually use Lamha to collect memories as presents and then print them out into physical form. And you've seen some businesses lock some really fun memories. Given all of this, we really had to think about where we're going to focus, how are we going to monetize this, what's going to work. So we choose to focus on the business space. And the reason we chose the business space is because of one finding that came out of Google in 2015, where what Google did was try to distinguish what made a team <laughs> successful. So they studied a few hundred teams across America and found that the single factor that made a team successful was a sense of psychological safety. Now, what does psychological safety mean? Psychological safety is essentially having the comfort to bring all parts of yourself to work and to express what you actually say and what you think and feel. You're actually talking about that. So everybody's talking about this idea, and one person quantified and said, within America alone, if we could increase psychological safety within the workplace, it's worth a few billion dollars to the economy because not having psychological safety leads to a lot of things like reduction in productivity, as well as essentially a lot of mental health issues within the workplace. So everybody's talking about this. But nobody's talking about how you can actually make it a reality. Well, given all of the work we've done with Lamha and the scientific backing we have for it, it looks like Lamha might actually be able to bridge this gap and increase psychological safety in the workplace. So we created our business-to-business -business product, which is called Lumworld. It has three parts to it. 
So the first one is interviewers, where we send in our trained interviewers to an organization to interview your staff. The second is the actual platform, which by itself can increase psychological safety. And then the third is a curated piece of content. So we can create web pages or videos or whatever you would like to actually showcase what the experience within your company is like. So why would you actually do this aside from psychological safety? Well, diversity and inclusion is one point where companies have done an increasingly better job at getting diverse people into the workplace, but not necessarily as good a job of keeping them there and making them feel heard and valued. The second thing is when you're hiring talent, talent usually has a lot of different options and they could go a lot of different ways. And perhaps using Lamha and the curated content, you could showcase what the experience of actually being in your firm is like. And that could be a distinguishing factor. The third piece is when an employee usually leaves a company, everything he or she has learned there leaves with them. And companies usually tend to retain institutional memory with financial and legal documents. This is a way of going beyond that and really humanizing your institutional memory. So we have a few contracts already, about two or three more that we got in the past two days, and we'd love your help to see if we can grow these business contracts even further. Um, in terms of revenue, Lum World, which is our business-to-business -business product, is going to be our main source of revenue until we can monetize Lumha itself, which is going to be beyond 3GB. We're going to have users pay. There are a lot of other product lines on here. I'm happy to talk about them in Q&A if you'd like. In terms of costs, the main ones are actual cloud storage, as well as the salaries for our employees. The team we have, like I said, I'm the founder and CEO. We've got two co-presidents. One is focused on operations and another one on marketing. For the summer, we had an amazing group of people. So Professor Johnson, our faculty advisor, and our first class of summer interns who are hiding back there. Um, our backbone really is our tech team and the world-class mentors and advisors. We have a few of them up on the slide, a lot more in the audience and hopefully tuning in. And we really hope that you choose to either join this team or our community of users by signing up on Lamha or downloading the app. If you would like to see Keller Center memories from this summer, go to lamha.com slash Keller Center. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lamha. Now for Q&A. Great job. Um, I really like the social impact of the first portion of the presentation. Uh, just as a little bit of feedback, I'm still confused on the business model. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different products that were put up. You said in Q&A you'd answer that, so if you could go into it a little bit more, please. Sure. So the primary one right now is Lum World, and the way that works is the three pieces. So if you would hire the interviewers, you pay the interviewers an hourly fee. For the platform, you have an initial setup cost because you can customize the platform to your requirements. So you can build your own filters, you can have your own fields for memory input and things. And after that, you pay a small subscription fee to maintain your storage cost. And then for each curated piece you ask for, you pay additionally. So some of our past contracts have asked for videos at the end of it or their own web page. For example, assuming Princeton was an actual contract, it would be memories.princeton.edu, which would have a live stream of all of the memories people are logging. So in the business to business world, that's it. Um, a lot of people are also interested in actually having physical jars available at tables for conferences and things like that, so we do a little bit of that. That's the business-to-business -business part of it. Um, in the direct-to-customer bit, within Lamha, once you cross 3 GB of storage of memory uploads, then you pay a monthly subscription fee for that. And we're thinking about and currently prototyping actually moving full-scale into the physical product space. So we're building a product right now called a Lum Jar which is sort of going to be a Bluetooth projector instead of being a Bluetooth speaker, where let's say on your dining table, you could keep the jar in the middle and then have your family memories play. Or you could put it in the corner of your room and have a digital wallpaper of your memories being broadcast, essentially. And the final piece of revenue is hopefully going to come from something called Lum Store, where all of the memories you're uploading into Lumha's platform as a user, you could order physical versions of. So we're working to recruit artists in emerging communities around the world and they're essentially going to say, OK, I can do hand-painted tiles. I can do knitted cloth. I can do t-shirts. I can do posters. So you choose the memory you want in physical form. You choose the form you want it in. And then you choose the artist from somewhere in the world. Most of the proceeds will go to the artist, but we'll keep a card of the transaction. So these are the revenue forms. Okay, just a little bit of feedback. That's a very complicated business model for an early startup. And you might want to think about tightening that up. But great job. 
Um, I, I'm familiar with the, the Google study on, on psychological safety, um, and I, I, I would commend you, because I've seen an earlier version of this, um, at, uh, in having sort of made the progress you have in sort of figuring out uh, where the hook is, because I had some of the same questions, but I, I, I've learned a lot more today. Um, so within that sort of psychological safety, and I guess specifically on diversity and inclusion, can you walk us through what that might look like? So I understand the pieces, but how does, how does this solution solve that problem? Sure. So I can talk to you about a use case. I can't give you the name of the institution that did this. But essentially, we were doing this with an institution where we had our interviewers go in and actually ask people about what their experiences were. And the first reaction we got from the interviewers was like, wow, I'd never spoken about that before. So that was one thing. But within the platform specifically, we've heard a lot of people say that, oh, I felt like I had to hide my disability earlier. I didn't really know how to bring it up within conversation because I felt like that would alienate people. We've worked with veterans who feel like, OK, you know, Lamha seems to me to be a safe place to talk about what my war memories were. Because if somebody doesn't want to read them, they can just scroll over them. Whereas in conversation, they might not feel comfortable bringing that up. So it's kind of this perception of, here is a safe space. Because it comes from the employers, they want us to be open about it. There was a study done by Deloitte two years ago that said that the reason 61% of employees feel like they have to cover up some part of themselves is because they think the employers want them to. So just by sanctioning a product like Lamha, saying this is a safe space where we want you to talk about your lives, it changes the way people perceive the work culture and therefore feel more comfortable expressing themselves. Uh, so this, this, this was a tough one for me because the, the, the first part of this, the, the, the empathetic connection, the connection that you have for the memory jars, the genesis of that with the, the kids and the elderly, it was like, Wow, it, it really connected uh, with me, and I could tell that it connected with you in doing that enough to even you know do your your thesis on it and, and everything like that was fantastic. So, I really I really felt like I, I got surprised at the end where all of a sudden we're going to the corporate market space uh, for for that, which seems really far away from from the the genesis. And you didn't necessarily sell me on that. That's really your passion here. Mm -hmm. It kind of to me it looked like oh gosh, we've got this really cool thing, who is going to pay for this? And just kind of looking around and saying, you know, businesses, they have money, they'll pay for it. Um, so uh, I, I really hope it, it, it works, um, and I hope that it can uh, maybe provide you the, then the ability to go back to what I think is truly your passion, which is the kind of the first part that you talked about that. Um, and when you are going into those companies or whatever, um, try to... Uh, you know, try to think, uh, it, it might be difficult, but try to think of, of how you might uh, express things in terms of a return on investment on this, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, and somehow quantifying uh, what it, uh, you know, what it is to lose employees and lose that organizational knowledge and do that. That would be the one thing that I have for you. But yeah, I, I got to say, you really got me with this first part. Thank you. Can I respond to that? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so when you go into businesses, we have a list of KPIs we usually go in with, which is productivity metrics and different metrics like that that the businesses are interested in. And in terms of what we actually care about, diversity and inclusion is a big deal. For me, I worked previously in an industry that was very male-dominated, and they would say that there wasn't sexism, but you know they'd go out to drinks and not invite you and do things like that. So it is something I care about. And for every business contract we do, 25% of the proceeds go towards a community need which is why you saw the balance of the paid and pro bono contracts. It's the way we fund our operations so that we can keep things in senior citizen homes and for the kids free of charge. Thank you. So if you were to put one memory right now into your personal Lumha jar, what would it be? It would have to be this exact moment. Hey, me too. <laughs> anyway, next up we have Tendo Technologies, a company creating a more uh, sensitive and cost efficient flow and temperature sensor.
Hi everyone, my name is Yu Yang, a mechanical engineer graduate from Princeton this past year. I'm the co-founder of Tendo Technologies. What you saw in the video was about measuring flow, uh, which we heavily rely on nowadays to ensure safety and efficiency in many industries. However, many problems still exist. For example, the Department of Energy estimated that more than $20 billion could be saved if the HVAC systems had better flow monitoring. On a more serious note, um, incorrect medication dosage resulting more than 3,000 deaths every year in the US and costing the healthcare institutions more than $3 billion annually. Uh, at Tendo, we have just the right technology to enable solution to those problems, called the elastic filament velocimetry. I know this is a mouthful, and most of you probably never heard the word velocimetry before. But what is important is that this is a pattern planning technology released from Princeton Research Lab, utilizing a platinum nano ribbon to accurately measure flow rate and temperature. This technology is capable of sensing flow rates smaller than any other sensors available on the market. And the same sensor can be placed in many different flu uh, fluids, such as air, water, toxic gas, or oil. Designed with um, standard manufacturing processing in mind, uh, our technology can easily be adopted by third-party manufacturer for mass production. And the uh, self-diagnostic feature can monitor the health level of the sensor and detect malfunction. With billions of dollars spent on flow sensors in these markets, our first point of penetration is the HVAC market. This is because we're seeing a trend in building a retrofitting uh, with more flow sensors, which means um, they are adding more flow sensors into uh, when, when making modifications of building, uh, build, building designs. Um, so, so this is great for us um, because um, well, that means there is already a need in the market. Um, at the same time, with less regulatory hurdles jump through in the HVAC market, um, you know, we can use the HVAC market as a stepping stone to validate our technology and outsource manufacturing before targeting a more mission critical applications such as medical injections and um, aerospace monitoring. So as I mentioned, we're seeing a trend in building HVAC retrofitting uh, because it increases energy efficiency, uh, improves the comfort of occupants, and it extends the equipment lifetime. And the government supports that too. In 2014, more than $1 billion was allocated um, to retrofit public buildings by New York City for these exact benefits. So Tendo's mission in HVAC is to provide a sensitive, durable, and user-friendly sensor uh, hardware solution that will lower sensor installation cost, uh, optimize uh, space used in HVAC, uh, in HVAC retrofitting design, and provide a more granular control uh, of HVAC systems that can enable greater energy saving. So the Tendo sensor offers, offers a direct replacement of current sensors in the market, uh, with, uh, packaged with compatible electric connections and standard communication protocols. Compared to other sensors in the market, uh, the Tendo sensor can measure flow directly, uh, are highly accurate, uh, are compact in size, and measure both flow and temperature. After talking to our potential customers, we learned that one, uh, some of the challenges in HVAC retrofitting lies in the high installation crew cost, um, which upwards $2,200 uh, uh, just for four added sensors in some particular systems. Uh, in addition, limitation in space uh, adds complexity to the retrofitting design. So the Tendo sensor actually addressed those uh, challenges exactly. With a two-in-one unit of both flow rate and temperature uh, measurement, we can reduce the number of sensors by half and um, lower the insula co insulation cost of at least 50%. Um, the small footprint of the sensor uh, allows more flexibility in HVAC design for the engineers. Well, even though we are focusing on sensors now, uh, we already have plans for um, many, uh, many package solutions that we know our uh, customer wants, for, uh, such as the uh, flow, flow cross sensor uh, for VAV boxes which are selling more than 10 million units every year in America alone already. And we offer direct replacement over there as well with um, you know, better sensitivity and uh, um, you know, direct digital control. Um, as well as control system, uh, control modules um, that further, uh, further the system integration that people um, need. We're already on track of commercializing this, this technology. Uh, we already negotiate a um, ex ex exclusive licensing deal with Princeton Univers University, 
as well in contact with a third party manufacturer who can in Oregon who can scale up the production. Um, we also received traction and form ongoing partnership and sign NDA with the HVAC uh, manufacturer who will help us test and the design the product. We are, uh, we are considering two uh, ways to approach the market. Uh, first, as an OEM, uh, OEM provider for uh, HVAC control companies, as well as a wholesale uh, approach to contractors who, uh, who, who make their purchase decisions based on uh, specifications from the engineers. So Tendo will um, build a commercial prototype uh, for testing and validation by the end of this year and outsource manufacturing set up by Q3 of, of next year before rolling out our commercial pro uh, product by the end of 2019. Uh, for the following year, uh, we'll be adding, oh, Tendo will be adding uh, a line of optional, um, optional uh, add-on components uh, such as um, no, di different communication options and uh, controllers for our customer to choose from. After that, Tendo will focus on more mission critical applications such as medical injections and aerospace monitoring. And we expect to see a revenue spike once uh, product roll out in those um, markets. So as I mentioned, uh, we will be, uh, we'll start manufacturing production by Q4 of 2019. And we expect to see a significant drop in cost of goods sold um, once, the, uh, when, once the manufacturing ramps up. And expect to, uh, we are hoping to um, become profitable by the end of 2021. We also secure uh, multiple non-dilutive funding, uh, most notably the National Science Foundation i program, which is supporting our ongoing uh, customer discovery process of interviewing more than 100 people in the HVAC ecosystem to understand what our customer needs and um, what, what, changes, uh, what changes their purchase decisions. Uh, we're also in the running, uh, in, in the price of the running for NSF, uh, SBIR and STTR grant, which are for $1 million with matching possibilities uh, to bridge the gap between research and uh, commercialization. To reach our uh, milestone of production and first revenue stream by Q4 of 2019, um, we are asked for $250,000 in investment to help fuel additional product development, uh, outsourcing fee, working capital, and uh, sales and, and uh, sales and marketing costs. Uh, we are flexible with the, the format and terms uh, and willing to work with investors on the details. So besides 30 plus, plus years of experience in uh, flow measurement uh, research, the co-founders, all Prince alumni, are also sens uh, sensor entrepreneurs, uh, experts in sensor manufacturing and hardware gurus, making sure that the science is sound and the sensors are, are accurate. This summer would not have happened without the team of talented and motivated uh, Princeton undergraduate students who really helped push the business side of things of Tendo um, off the ground. And our, uh, in addition, our Elan mentors have worked really closely with us along the way to um, provide extremely valuable feedback, uh, connections, and insights. Um, so, so together, um, we'll get the juice flowing. Uh, oops, I meant we'll get the air flowing, or water, or oil, or medicine, whichever flu you, you prefer, and act accurately measure it. Thank you. Um, nice, nice job. Yeah. It's so, uh, so nice to see how this has um, changed and grown um, since I've looked at this yeah. technology now, yeah. wow, a couple years ago. Couple years um, ago. I guess um, my question is really about the NSFI course, so congratulations for getting into that program. It sounded like you're still in the, in the middle of that. Yes. What's the key takeaway from all of these um, uh, HVAC customer uh, contacts that you have. I know NSF makes you do right. a lot of those. Yes. <laughs> um, but can you boil it down to like what's the big thing and have you pivoted in any way based on what you've learned from customers? Right, no, so, so, so you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the NSF make us make, uh, do a lot of interviews. And uh, so, so we have a lot of data points. Uh, so what's important is the data points would drive the decision. Uh, so what we found is um, there's the HVAC industry is really fragmented. So um, we listed two approaches. One is OEM to, um, to uh, the HVAC control companies uh, versus a wholesale approach to uh, indivi individual contractors. So for the second approach, um, what, what's, what's very interesting, the key takeaway is uh, the people who, who pay some money, the person who makes the decision and the end user are all different. 
uh, and you no, know, there are a lot of influence among all of them. So, so uh, and, and one of the key takeaways is you need to break down more of the uh, custom segments. Even for the HVAC control companies, they are um, they can be break down into many different different things. And one very interesting thing we pivoted a little bit is before we thought energy efficiency is something everyone wants. Um, and I've to talk to a lot of people. Uh, most people really don't care uh, about energy efficiency. Uh, they just want to achieve the thing available that works okay enough. Uh, like when, when you work in office building, you probably you know, feel cold or hot a lot of times, but no one cares about that. Um, no. Even though you are the end user, but you're not paying for the bill. Uh, and the people who design the building uh, probably care more about who pays, uh, who pays for their jobs rather than the end user's needs. Um, but uh, it turns out that uh, some people do actually care about energy efficiency uh, in the end, uh, which are, for example, institutional owners like Princeton University itself, because they will be here for hundreds of years. So they do care about even small energy gains uh, with a return of investment within five to seven years. They are happy with that. Um, so that, that's one of very interesting uh, key takeaways. Um, but we are uh, focusing on um, being an OEM for the, uh, for the manufacturers now because uh, no, they, are, they are the decision maker and the um, payer. And so, so it's a lot easier to communicate with them uh, at the early stage. Uh, excellent presentation thank and uh, great branding around the product. What's uh, that? Great branding oh, around you. the product. Yeah. Really nice job. Um, so the question that I have for you is I, I noticed that your, uh, that your revenue projections were uh, interesting, <laughs> and, right? There were two kind of bifurcated forms of revenue. One was from sale of the sensor itself, right. is that correct? And the other was from the sale of a kind of manufactured product with the sensor. Yes. Um, one of those, I believe it was the sensor itself, seemed to generate essentially negligible revenues for you going five years out. Much smaller than the other, yes. Um, and so it, why is that a part of the business plan and, and you know, Okay. Why is the sensor generating such a small amount of revenue? No, that, that's a great question. So, so the reason why that's still in the plan is because uh, for our other package solutions, we use this underlying technology. So we need to make sure the, the technology is validated and the manufacturer can be scaled up and accurate enough. So that's why we have that. Uh, that's part of the reasons. Um, and what, what, what's, what really drives the decisions here is the customer segments. Uh, different customers want different things. Uh, we provide different value proposition to them. For example, people who want the sensors alone, they probably just want something cheap. Uh, so we are you know, uh, competing on, on, on the, the cost, which is uh, arguably not a great, a great business. Uh, however, the other package solutions, we, are, we can see a lot more uh, margin in that, and uh, that's something we can price it a lot higher because we provide value proposition that's not just being cheap. Great answer, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I can really uh, sense those guys at Tendo are gonna be successful. Anyway, uh, last but not least, Homeworks Trenton runs an after-school boarding program for middle and high school girls in Trenton, New Jersey. And some of you may recognize Homeworks from the demo day last year, and that's because they love the eLab program so much, they decided to come back for a second year. Now, their presentation will be a little different from the others. You'll see their lovely promo video after their pitch. According to the Trenton Superintendent's most recent findings in 2016, 34% of the students from Trenton High School did not graduate. One third of the students were chronically absent. 83.3% of the students did not reach the literacy expectations and 92.9% .9 did not reach math. Additionally, only 5% of the students were, met the national college readiness benchmarks. These facts speak for themselves. Students in low-income communities do not have adequate access to academic support, a safe place to be in the evenings, and have fewer opportunities for leadership and empowerment. We need to find a new innovative solution to these challenges. Some people have looked to boarding schools as a potential solution. Boarding schools address attendance rates because they offer these following benefits. Extracurricular enrichment, academic and social support,
academic social support, um, a stable environment, and one-on-one -on -one support for students. However, boarding schools are not necessarily accessible to all students. As a boarding school graduate, I have seen firsthand how living with teachers and classmates can empower students and transform students to become life lear lifelong learners. Living with 40 girls um, for over four years empowered me to grow from a timid girl my father used to call a mouse to a more confident and more empathetic woman. Boarding schools, however, are traditionally for wealthier families and, and for students to leave their own communities. So what if there was a low cost, scalable solution to the problems that we see in low income communities? That's what we've been doing for the last two years. Hi, my name is Natalie Tung, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Homeworks Trenton. Hi, I'm Elijah Sumners. I'm the community relations director. My name is Maddie Barron, and I'm our operations manager. And I'm Greg Kord, the director of marketing. And Kylie Coates is our program di programming director, and we, we are, are Homeworks. Homeworks. Homeworks Trenton is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides an after-school boarding program to middle and high school girls in Trenton, New Jersey. We deliberately do not seek to replace, but instead act as a supplement to the Trenton public school system. Our model is unlike any other. Our students attend their public schools during the day and then stay overnight with us at our homeworks house. At homeworks, we provide the benefits of a boarding school without the high fixed costs, bureaucracy, and scalability issues of an actual school. We pro homeworks provides highly motivated young women from low-income communities with opportunities that are typically found outside of their communities. This is not just a dream. This is a reality. And we've been doing this for the past two summers. Last summer with five girls, and this summer with ten. So what does a typical week look like? We start on Sunday evenings with a family potluck, as we believe in establishing a strong relationship with our parents. After the parents leave, the girls have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with our staff, a safe place to establish trust. The bo girls board from Sunday evenings until Friday mornings so that they can reconnect with their families over the weekend. Throughout the week, we transferred our scholars to and from their summer programs to ensure that they attended on time. After school each day, our scholars participated in academic projects, curriculum and bonding activities, and then stayed overnight at the house. So what have we learned the past two summers? Number one, details matter. This was not easy. Among many other logistics, we had to secure our licensing, our insurance, our house, our staff, our van, our curriculum, and more. But we also couldn't forget about the, I guess, the smaller details that were equally as, as important, such as our transportation routes, our discipline policy, our check-in and check-out sheets, and more. Number two, the power of partnerships. This summer we partnered with five different summer programs and 19 other organizations, all of whom have shown extraordinary support and optimism. Three, focused academics. This summer we decided to focus on civic engagement and women empowerment. Through a, a project-based curriculum, our girls tackled a problem that they saw in their communities and came up with solutions. They presented their findings to community leaders, including Reed Gussiora, the mayor of Trenton. We also provided workshops with Girls Unlimited and Women's Space, which focused on building a woman's self-confidence and through experiential learning. And we, our goal is to create the next generation of female leaders in Trenton. Number four, Trenton wants this. We have had to turn away more than half of the students that applied to our program. Additionally, over 85 people applied for jobs in our residential staff, some with more than 30 years of experience working with students. Number five, our model works and is scalable. Despite the challenges that public schools face, our scholars are powerful, capable, and driven young women ready to leave a mark in Trenton and the world. We want to take this much further with a program that coincides with the academic school year beginning in the fall of 2019. We'll begin with 10 freshman high school girls and add 10 girls each year until we reach a capacity at 40. We know our model works and we want to see this replicated in other low income communities as a cost efficient and powerful way to impact the lives of young people. Under the guidance of Angela Duckworth's lab, we have tracked progress in psychological safety, perceived stress, grit, and more and we're finding powerful impacts. For example, 71% of our scholars rose in their grit over just four weeks. Additionally, we have three scholars returning from our first pilot last summer to this summer's cohort, and each of them have returned as leaders in their communities. For example, 
Kiera was elected president of her summer program, having run a successful campaign and being elected by her peers. Zoe developed Trenton's first youth summit, where Trenton residents under the age of 21 had the opportunity to meet with the newly elected mayor and talk about the challenges that, that they face as the youth in their communities. And DeRay is a member of the highly competitive Trenton Youth Chorus and even gave a speech during our summer gala to our supporters and organizations. Our parents have also talked to us about their tremendous growth that they have seen in each of their daughters over the past four weeks. One of our parents said, she's improved in, our, in her communication, the way she talks to people, her problem solving skills, and the way she deals with certain situations. Our model works. We just need the funds and that's where you can help us. Our first year of operations will cost about $262,000. That's $26,000 per student per year. For one girl to attend our program for four years, it will cost $104,000. That is about a third of the indirect costs incurred by the average American high school dropout. That cost is paid by taxpayers like you. We'll charge nominal tuition, but most of our funds will come from individual donors, corporate sponsorships, and private and government grants. As mentioned previously, one of the biggest lessons that we've learned this summer is the power of partnerships. We've had the opportunity to connect with many bedrock organizations in Trenton, including Homefront, the Christina Sykes Academy, and Isles, all of whom have shown us extraordinary optimism and support. Organizations have also donated resources to our pilot program this summer, including food for four weeks, furnishings for the girls' rooms, and curriculum content. For our year program, our Sustainable Fair, a local organization, has also agreed to give um, food for the full year of the program. Additionally, a local nonprofit has also offered to rent their, their newly renovated house at below market rates. We are also closely mentored by community leaders, entrepreneurs, and corporate and um, corporate people who have much experience in nonprofit and education ventures. Your donation will make an impact in our scholars' growth. We have already secured over $160,000, but we still have a long way to go. With your help, we can fully fund our full year program and show the community that HomeWorks works. We are asking you to help us raise $214,000 more, and this will cover the first year of operations, as well as, was previously mentioned, helping our scholars grow as people. And we, we are, are HomeWorks. Homeworks. Works for the young women in Trenton when they feel empowered, self affirmed, and compassionate. This is Trenton's first after school boarding program. And now we have a short video from our scholars and parents. Back. 
and she was the first car to call me. I'm going to go home, but you are home here. You see me, you know, my other phone. Thank you, Homeworks. And now for the Q&A. Wow, very moving, I have to tell you. Um, I think that uh, what you're doing is absolutely extraordinary, and you're changing the world, and it's incredible. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the fundraising plan that you have. You've already done a great job so far, and who's leading that? And you mentioned grants and private individuals. I'm wondering if you've added family foundations. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, so, so far, um, we have sorry can you hear me so far we have um, mostly raised our funds from individual donors um, we have v a few grants um, but very very small grants and uh, most of as what we were talking about before most of it has been the power of partnership so our food our furniture our curriculum it's all been donated for free uh, moving forward we're hoping as we have done this for the second time now we'll be able to reach out to more grants um, and to foundations and hopefully to uh, corporate um, companies as well and see if they would be willing to donate either their resources or their funding. Um, this is actually what I'll be doing next year. Um, I We actually got a $30,000 grant um, for me to go out and um, write more grants and to get more money as well as be in the community. And how many people came back of the original funders for the second year? How many people repeated? Um, in terms of funders? Yeah. Um, so we have just start. we just started our fundraising campaign um, around a year ago. And so a lot of them, a lot of the funds that have been donated has actually been this past year. So we've, we're still in our first round. Um. Yeah, fantastic, uh, great, great job. Um, can tell that you really care about this. Um, so with, with 10 every year, and I like that rollout plan, and it allows you to, to do that, uh, who, how do you do admissions? Like how do you, how do you choose if so many people wanna come? Are there specific criteria that you're, you're using? Will those evolve over time? Who's in charge of that? Um, so this year we did student interviews, parent interviews, and a separate application for both. So parents would give an application and students had a written application. And we used those, the criteria on those applications to choose our cohort for this summer. Um, also, what's on that application and also what we're trying to judge from the interviews that we do with the parents and with the students is basically who's going to benefit from this program the most. Um, so first and foremost, we look at students who are highly motivated and then we also look at need. Yeah, and if you saw the video, um, Lavina's mom's speech, like we really thought that Lavina would benefit from our program and being in a very supportive environment. She came in and she interviewed, she was so shy, she was shaking the entire time, and could she could barely speak above a whisper, and then you saw her just sort of grow and blossom a little bit under the support and the community and the sisterhood. So uh, obviously my thoughts echo uh, the rest of the panel up here. Amazing work that you're, that you're doing, and you know, what I, what I would like to see, I think I'd like to see you think more about trying to figure out uh, what you can do with the program itself as far as not just grants, not one-off grants, but actually, you know, Department of Education contracts, for example, their transportation contracts that people get that drive the buses around, et cetera, that can offset some of the costs of what you're doing. You may not turn it into a profit-generating enterprise, but you may be able to reduce the cost so much that it becomes a more scalable venture. And the reason why I say that is because you're, you're really changing people's lives. Obviously, you know that. That's impacting everyone in this room. If you could do that for not just rolling out 10 at a time, but rolling out 10, then rolling out 100, then rolling out 100 new cities, right? you could really change the next generation significantly. So just think about ways to make the business, to make it more of a scalable business so you can touch more lives. Thank this you. is great work, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So watching the Homeworks team put together their program this summer has truly been inspiring, and I'm honored to have been a part of it. 
Uh, so that concludes this year's Demo Day presentations, and we hope you enjoyed watching their journeys as much as we did. But this is only the beginning. When the day comes that we have Afari and Lumha on our phones, Catnu in our pantries, TerraViews in our stores, and all the amazing innovation and improvements that Alira, Homeworks, and Tendo bring into our lives, you'll know where it all began. Thank you. And please uh, go out and talk to our teams at their demo stations. They'd love to talk to you all and tell you more. Sorry.